don't say anything. Shut up. I don't say that. I thank her for doing that. So that's respecting the spiritual gifts of different people. And respecting the spiritual gift I, we have. And then we use it for God's glory. And we don't use it for our own glory. So that's how we honor each other. And we see each other as one body. Now this is very important in the priorities of life. Build up a strong relationship with God. That's the most important thing. A strong relationship with God. Love God. And really desire God. Hung hunger for God. And bear fruit of the Holy Spirit. So that's the spiritual life. That we bear fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then we love and bless people. When we have this spiritual life, we want to bless people. And then we'll fulfill our different responsibilities, our family, our work, our church, and then serve God in our life and our ministry. And then we serve God. So this is the priority. We don't put our spiritual gift first. Actually, I would put spiritual gift number six. Okay, I, I should put spiritual gift as number six here. First, you serve God, and then you build up the spiritual gift. Now, sometimes it can be before serving God. We want to build up spiritual gifts. So first, it's not how powerful we are. First is our relationship with God, and then the spiritual life. So do you have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness? And then we want to love people and bless people and be able to counsel them, help them have the willingness to help them and fulfill our different responsibilities. Some people serve God, but they don't pay attention to the family. That's not right. And then also we serve God in our life and our ministry. Now, our life is in our daily life and our ministry. And then six is spiritual gifts. So that's the order of priority that some people put the ministry as number one, above the wife, above the family, and the family is broken up because they just put time in the ministry and never put time of, of, uh, to the wife and the family. So we want to put things in order. The family responsibility should be above serving God. That we want to have a good family before we serve God. If a person has a broken family, he cannot serve God for long. He'll be troubled by his family every day. So we need to have a good family before we can serve God joyfully. Okay, and then how to discover our spiritual gifts. We can start with things we naturally want to do. Now some people have musical sense. Now if a person has musical sense, then he should develop the musical gift. But then he can have more gifts than that. It's not just one gift. Now some people hear music, immediately they will start moving the body, following the rhythm. But some people can never follow the rhythm. Now I noticed that in Africa, the people really can follow the rhythm. They really have a musical sense. So that's something that it's, it's wonderful. The African people can use that gift. The musical uh, gift can be used more in the African church. And then some people want to care for people. Some people naturally want to do that. And usually women do that better than men. In a family, we see that the wife takes care of the family members more than the husband. So that's a spiritual gift that God gives to um, women more. And so when we want to care for the members of the church, uh, the women should be more active. Now, sometimes the pastors has to admit that. Some pastors have problems listening to people. Some pastors don't have the patience to listen to people's problems. They don't have the patience to care for them. Then he should, now first he should learn to listen more and be, to be kind to people more and to uh, meet the needs of the people. At the same time, he wants to develop that. At the same time, he wants to train more women, help more women to be able to help others. Now when he trains the, men, uh, the women, he trained them to have a good relationship with God, to have a heart of love, of compassion. But for the details, 
for the woman, the woman knows better. The woman knew better, uh, know better than the pastor how to, you know, how to uh, pay attention to the needs of the person, uh, how the person is suffering from sickness, how the person needs help in the f taking care of the family, how the person need to uh, need help in uh, 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 managing the, their daily life, so that the women can do that better. Now, as Christians, we should try to help each other as much as we can, but we don't want to want the people to depend on us. We don't make people rely on us. But if we s hear that a member uh, doesn't cook food properly, that the family members don't eat food properly and they get sick, then we should have someone to help them how to cook food properly. Because if they cannot cook food properly, then the family would not be in a good condition and they cannot love God uh, too because they, 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 have, they have a lot of burdens. Now, if we know that a family, the husband and wife fights, we need to help them. Because if they don't have a good uh, husband and wife relationship, they won't be able to love God. They won't be able to serve God. So we need to help the people in every area of their life. Of course, we don't, you know, we don't uh, st stick our nose into their life, but we ask them, how is everything? If we know that they have problems, then we should help them if we know that they have problems. Now, if they don't have problems, we don't have to stick our nose into the life. Uh, it just when we know that they are problems. So when we counsel people, we can ask them, how's your family? How's your relationship with your family members? How, how is your relationship with other people? If they, if they tell us they have problems, then we need to help them. We need to counsel them. So some people have this natural tendency to care for people. And some people have uh, the natural tendency to want to share what God has done in their lives. Some people want to to sh uh, share testimonies, and some people want to do evangelism. Some people want to share God's messages to preach. Some people want to uh, build, uh, make the building better, to improve on the building. So each person has different gifts. Some people can have more than one, one gifts. Most people have more than one gifts. So we want to develop these gifts so that we can you know, serve God better. Uh, Okay, let me see if you are asking some question. Okay, now I see that looks like there is some question. Okay, so I'm going to uh, spend this time answering the question now. I have to uh, read the question now. Okay, um, what will you do to a person who likes bringing trouble in a church? You have talked to him as leaders in a in several occasions and he pretends to hear and later he keeps repeating the same does hurt new members severely uh, as a pastor what would you do another, qu another question in a church context whereby the pastor's children are ill-mannered what would be the duty of the church members okay now here I will answer this question so next time, two weeks from now, we'll talk about the uh, uh, spiritual gifts. Okay. Um, so um, when a person brings trouble, we have to find out what kind of trouble that is. Um, well, if you call it trouble, then it's really trouble. <laughs> You know, it must be some kind of trouble. It, it's not something small. If it's something small, then it's not a trouble. Uh, it, if uh, the person, you know, chase up the girls, that's very serious. So we have to talk to the person. Now, when we talk to the person, we don't, don't just say stop. We ask them, why do you do that? Do you know that you're offending God? Uh, how is the relationship with God? Because then we find out the root problem. It's not just 
chasing after the girl. The root problem is that this person has problem in his relationship with God. Because this person uh, cannot manage his inner life. He has low self-image, so he wants to chase up the girls, or he has lust problem, so he's controlled by his lust. So he, he has a lot of problems. So we want to find out first. And then we discern whether this person wants to change. Do you want to change? Do you want to please God? Do you want God to bless your life? Do you want to have a good marriage in the future? That's the motivation. If the person doesn't want to change, he just wants to chase up the girls, he doesn't want to pray, he doesn't want to talk to us. Now, if a person doesn't want to talk to us, he doesn't want to stop his sinful ways, then we have to According to Matthew 18, we bring one or two persons to talk to him, to verify what he has said, what he would do, and what he would not do. And then, if he's still not willing to, to change, then we talk to the whole church. So, there are different situations. The first situation is that he is weak. He doesn't know how to handle his life. He has emotional problem. He's lonely. So then, and he's willing to change. So we know this problem, then we have someone to follow up on him, to help him to overcome the problem. So we have counseling. We don't just command him to change. So it's very important to, for us to understand counseling. So after we finish this spiritual gift, now it, it will, take at least another session to finish spiritual gift because I still have a lot of material to talk about. After that, I can talk about counseling because that's something very important to learn. Uh, because if this person uh, just have wow, a lot of anger from his family, he has been hurt many times and his heart has not been healed. He has, you know, problem relating to people and therefore that's why he caused problem in the church then we want to talk to this person and to we want to um, we want to uh, help this person to uh, to understand his problem and does he want to change and then guide him to change and tell uh, ask him how he can change and then and then ask him is it okay I tell you some ways to change now why do we ask questions like that Sometimes, some pastors are in a rush to t tell them what to do. They just say, go home and pray and do this and do that. And the person just nod their head, and then, but they go home and do nothing. So we want to ask them, okay, what do you think you can do to change? So let the person think. That's the, the importance of counseling. Let the person think. He thinks, and then he will think of some way. When he thinks of some way, and then we say, this is a good idea. Do it then, and can you do it? Because then if it's his idea and it's a good idea, then he will be more motivated to follow. Now that's true for teaching our children also. Some parents just force the children to study. But we can ask them, okay, do you want to improve uh, your studying? Uh, you, do you want to improve your, your uh, schoolwork and your future, your spiritual life, everything? Uh, and, and do you have some good ideas? And if, if, the, if the children said, yes, uh, I, I think of one way, and then you say, tell me, tell me. Okay, and he, he says it, oh, that's a good idea. And, and I'll, I'll be very happy when you start to do it. So that's how we encourage people. Okay, now, but if a person is, he's hurting the church intentionally, then what do we do? Then we have to, now first we tell them, okay, God has a wonderful plan in your life. And then if you obey God, your whole life will be blessed by God. And do you want to be blessed by God? So we ask them, do you want to be blessed by God? And if he's willing, then he's willing to change. Then we, but we still have to watch over the person to see how he is. And, and if the person keep doing it, then we have to tell one or two persons, or tell the whole church and then the whole church will watch over him 
So if he continue to chase after other girls, then we have to stop him. And uh, in some churches I, in Africa, I noticed that there is a sinner's bench. So the sinners sit there, and then he's not allowed to talk to the girls. And uh, he's restricted in, in, in his activity. So, and then if he still does something bad secretly, uh, if he still doesn't obey, there is a time we have to say, you have to leave the church. He cannot talk to any members until you repent. Now, when they repent, we can still let him come back. So that's how we handle uh, the person who uh, does destruction to the church. But you have to be more specific, okay? Uh, the person who asked this question, you have to be more specific. If you have other trouble in mind, uh, if a person is always gossiping, uh, about the pastor, about the church, about other church member, and and cause problem. We still have, we have to talk to the person. We have to handle the problem, so that the person will not continue to gossip because gossiping would destroy a church. Now, if a pastor has something to improve, he has to improve. Then he should say, "Okay, tell me." Now, the pastor himself should be humble to say, "Tell me," and I will try. And I'll see if this is area I, I need to change. Now, sometimes people have suggestions for the pastor, but the pastor think that this is not necessary. It's not necessary to change because there, sometimes there are unreasonable demands. Now, I have heard in some churches, I don't know about your churches, they want all the women to wear skirts, long skirts. Now, uh, well, it's a European custom, European custom that brought to Africa, that uh, in some European and American churches, that they always wear skirts when they go to church. But this is not commanded in the Bible. The Bible never commanded that. The Bible never said that. The, uh, the women cannot wear pants. Now, some of you pastors may disagree with me, but it's, well, it's up to you. If your church, in your church, the women can only wear skirts, then it's up to you to decide. Now, we don't have this rule in Hong Kong that it's up to you. But what I'm saying is some people, they want to impose on other people, like they impose on a pastor, you have to do this, do that. Uh, the pastor can say, um, now some churches, they, some members say, Pastor, you haven't visited me for a long time. The pastor doesn't have to visit everyone. Now, sometimes, some, you know, the church organizes some people to visit. Now, in some situations, the pastor should visit the people, but he might not have time to visit everyone. So, sometimes it's an unreasonable demand. Sometimes, some people would use that to speak against the pastor. He doesn't visit me. He hasn't visited me. Now, that is an unreasonable demand. Then the church leaders should handle that and uh, explain that to the person. Uh, so, now usually a problem like that shouldn't cause a big problem, but sometimes adultery. If it's a big problem of adultery, then it has to be uh, handled very... Uh, we still want to find out why he committed adultery so that we can stop him com from committing adultery in the future. So it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we don't talk with him to find out more. We still need counseling. We don't just yell at him. Okay, now, and then uh, uh, the pastor says that he presents to hear but neither repeats. Then if he repeats, then we ask some people to watch over him. And he keep st still keep repeating then we have to find ways to handle it. Then he cannot, he cannot uh, talk to the members. He cannot, uh, you know, he cannot relate to the members. He just sit on the sinner's bench and listen to the message. So there will be restriction on what, on what he can do. And if he continue to do it and it's a severe problem, uh, at one point we have to stop him from coming to church until he repents. Okay, uh, if the pastor's children are ill-mannered, 
then this pastor has problem because he didn't take care of his family problem first. Then uh, that should be uh, the pastor really should try to help the children. And also the pastor may need the counseling of another pastor. Unless someone in the church is experienced enough to counsel the pastor to find out how he is doing relating to the children. So it's very important for the pastor to have good relationship with his wife and with the children. If he, you know, yells at his children all the time and he, or he doesn't uh, help the children spiritually, he doesn't help them in their daily life, then the children doesn't have good spiritual life, then the pastor should, you know, find out, we should find out whether the, the pastor has problem, you know, in his own daily life. So, if the problem is serious, even his children should be taken care of like any other members. That's, they have to sit on a sinner's bench or they cannot come to church. Now, if it's just children problem, you know, children like running around, yelling, crying, things like that, then if the church has a place and put the child there and have someone watch over the, the children, then it's, you know, it's not intentional. Then you don't kick the child out of the church because he's crying, but you put him somewhere else at that time. So it, the, the church member should handle it. The church leader should handle it. Or even if the pastor has problem in his spiritual life, in his uh, in any way in his life, then someone should take care of that. Because uh, some people think that pastors cannot be, you know, his problem cannot be handled. That's not true. Pastor is still a person. If a pastor has problem in his spiritual life, he is weak spiritually. His sermon has problems. He cannot lead the church. Then the leaders should talk to him to find out the problem, it should be counseling. Now, if the leaders cannot do that, uh, if possible, then find another pastor. Now, if any of you have a pastor that has a problem and is willing, I'm willing to counsel him with WhatsApp, with WhatsApp phone and to counsel him or with WhatsApp messages. Okay, and then and a question. I know a lot of people and pastors today who use their gifts because they wanted to grow make money and have a large church, what can we do when we find ourselves in such situation? Uh, I love the point when you said we don't serve God to look good, but we serve God to glorify God. Yes, thank you. Yes, we serve God to, uh, we do things, our spiritual gift is for glorifying God, not for us to look good. Okay, if people use the spiritual gift because they just want to make money, uh, uh, they just want a big church for their own glory. Um, if this is serious, well, okay. Let me say, if it's not so serious that it's happening, if I'm a member, I will still want to talk to the pastor or talk to the leaders how to handle it. I would, now, of course, if the problem is very small, we cannot, you know, pick on every problem of the pastor. We want to talk about certain problems uh, that affect other people. Uh, if the pastor is very proud, the pastor always talks about his own spiritual gifts and doesn't help other people to build up the spiritual gifts, then we can talk to the pastor about that, the church, uh, uh, the church leaders or ask some another pastor come to counsel the pastor on that. Uh, so that's when it's not very serious. But when it's very serious, that means it's very obvious the pastor just want to make more money. Just he's ambition motivated. He's ambitious. Just now we want to have a big church, but to have the ambition to have a big church is a different thing. What is the difference? To have the ambition to have a big church, that means it's to show off. He wants to have a big church to show off to other people. He just put all the effort into 
expecting the church to look very beautiful and, and attract more people, but they, he doesn't pay attention to spiritual life. He doesn't pay attention to caring about the members, just want the church to look good. Uh, if I'm in such a church, if I'm a lay person, I still want to talk to the leaders to handle this, or I want to talk to the pastor to handle this. And if it's very serious, I will honestly say uh, the way to do it is either to, uh, to ask the pastor to leave or if the pastor will take control of the whole church, then I will leave. I will not want to stay in a church when the pastor is seeking money for himself or is stealing money or is doing anything immoral that he has problem in a spiritual life. I don't want to follow such a pastor. That we don't have to. We don't have to. So, but first step is to handle it in church, to try to take care of the problems in the church. Now, of course, yeah, let me say this, you know, for instance, some pastors, they really don't have a strong gift of preaching. The preaching is not strong. We don't kick the pastor out because his preaching is not strong. Uh, we can try to raise up another pastor who has a strong, stronger gift of preaching, but we still accept the pastor if he's preaching the truth, if he's preaching the truth, but he's not, preach he's not a good preacher. We still accept him. So now when I was converted, when I went to my church, let me tell you honestly, my pastor, his sermons was quite boring. Uh, it, it's not inspiring. Actually, I learned more reading books than listening to his sermons. But I still listen to him. I still follow because he's teaching the truth. He was teaching the truth. He was not a powerful preacher. He was not a, an attractive preacher. But I still listen to him and learn from him. And I still obey. We, sh we should not make, you know, eloquent, elo uh, eloquence in preaching as a requirement. Of course, when we select a pastor, we have the choice to select what kind of pastor. But uh, after the pastor is there, we don't say, well, your preaching is not powerful enough, so we don't want you. Uh, we don't do that to a pastor. Unless if the pastor is not preaching, preaching the truth and the pastor is not doing his, his responsibility, then we can handle that and we can say, okay, this is, uh, we, want to, we want to find ways that how can we take care of the members better? How can we follow on the members so that we don't continue to lose members, so that we don't stop growing? Okay, now, um, I've answered your questions now, and so we now we close. And if you have any more questions, you can send it in the group. I'm happy to have you here today, and I hope that you're all motivated to learn. Uh, there are many things I want to teach. Now, I have uh, spent a long time talking about motivating people with God's grace and balance of grace and the law, and also how to preach. I put a long time into that. And now I'm putting my effort into practical ways to do ministry. And, and these are very important. These are very important. And I thank God that He has given me uh, the gift and these ideas of how to train. Uh, and I hope that you would motivate other pastors. Uh, even if they don't have a projector, they just use a cell phone. They can watch it. Okay, let's close with a prayer. Father, we thank You that You give us spiritual gifts. You give us spiritual gifts so we can serve You more efficiently so we can uh, reach people with the gospel so we can touch people's lives so we can pray for people to experience the work of the holy spirit so we can bring people to love you more and build up the church and build up your your kingdom and glorify you all the way thank you father you're a good father you're a wonderful father you're a good god you're a wonderful god we love you we adore you we want to serve you we thank you for giving us spiritual gifts you are a good God. You give us spiritual gift. And you give us spiritual life so that we can use these spiritual gifts properly. So that we don't use this for our own glory. We use this for your glory and for 
benefiting other people, for helping other people. Father, we ask you to give us strength and give us wisdom so that we can serve you better. Father, we need you, we need you, we need you. You're a wonderful God. We need you so that we can serve better, so that our life is full of your glory. Oh Lord, fill us with your glory, with your spiritual life, so that people can see the love, your love in our life, your peace in our life, your wisdom in our life. But all this is for your glory. So people will say, God is good, God is good, God is good. Father, we thank you. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with the Holy Spirit so that we will serve you more. Oh Lord, we need you. We need you. Thank you, Father. We need you. We need you. We need you to, to uh, in our daily life. We need you in our spiritual life and in our, in our ministry. We need you, Lord. Oh Lord, bless us. Give us wisdom to manage our ministry, to help the church to grow, to, uh, to help our members to grow, and to raise up people to serve God in our church. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, teach us what to do. Help us to do the things in your way. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> God bless you. And I hope that you all enjoy God all the time and be filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. Okay? Thank you.